So thanks very much. I appreciate it, Taran. In fact, he's almost given my whole presentation. So, so first of all, uh, wonderful to be in Paris, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have the stage today and to explain a little bit about what carbon engineering is doing and what we intend to do. So, in this conversation, or in the, the conversation today, I'm going to be talking about things like carbon and energy flows, about uh, climate challenges that we're facing as a global society, the kinds of things that are pretty typical in a 2016 presentation. But I'm also going to spend time talking about a solution that has the potential to bend the curve on our ability to break free of, of fossil fuels over the next coming decades. And uh, spoiler alert, the, 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 the option here and the solution is really the production of synthetic hydrocarbons from a combination of atmospheric CO2 coupled to renewables that has now the potential to get to under a dollar a liter. So I'm going to start by posing a question, which is, how did we manage to so quickly get so far out of balance in the climate? And the way I see this is that for the hundreds of millions of years, the Earth has managed to, to live within a relatively short and young carbon cycle, sort of in the order of days to years to, to centuries. And through that period of time, in the last couple hundred million years, every year, some small amount of that carbon was extracted from that flux, and some amount of that found its way underground, embodying energy absorbed by plants and animals in the form of hydrocarbons like coal and, and oil. And kind of think about it like every year the Earth is making a small deposit in a long-term savings account. And then not so long ago, humans came along, and for the most part of our history, we played nice and lived within the Earth's carbon cycles and managed to, to extract what we needed from the energy and carbon fluxes that existed within the biosphere until about a couple hundred years ago, we figured and we found these massive deposits of hydrocarbons underground, and that's really what allowed us to enter into the industrial age. And so from, and so we think about the, 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 the hydrocarbons themselves have really entered in this era of incredible prosperity, innovation, and mobility. Uh, and at this point now, you know, if we look at where we are in, in 2016, we're making withdrawals from that energy bank account to the tune of almost 100 million barrels a day. And if you want to compare that to how quickly has the Earth been making these deposits, if we think that it's taken about 100 million years to get 2 trillion barrels of deposits underground, it means that the Earth's been able to put away about 55 barrels of oil a day. And so going back to this question about how do we get so far out of balance, it's pretty obvious if you're taking more than a million times, or taking carbon out of the ground a million times faster than the Earth's putting it back in, you're going to get out of balance very quickly. So where does this leave us? Um, it leaves us on a wealthy but a warming planet that really has a major challenge to get to net zero in the course of just a couple of decades. And so it's going to be really a very big challenge, but the answer lies in figuring out how to get back to within Though, and, and to live within those carbon and energy fluxes that exi ex exist within the biosphere. So first let's understand that there's certainly no silver bullet that's going to get us to zero. Right now we're dealing with a 40 billion ton a year waste disposal problem and we've developed an energy system which is effectively a once through system where we pull hydrocarbons out from under the ground, strip out the energy that we need and leave the carbon wrapper up in the atmosphere. So there's really three categories of solutions that we're going to need to deploy to get to zero. And the first is that we need to deploy energy without carbon attached to it. And so what this means is really the, the electrification of everything that we can possibly electrify and the massive deployment of renewables. And that has the potential to get us more than 50% of the way, probably, probably, probably much more than 50% of the way to zero. The second is that we need to start thinking about carbon recycling. And so if we think about the fact that you know, carbon itself isn't a bad substance, and in fact, it's an essential ingredient to most of the things we use on a daily basis, uh, the fact is, is that we have this now very abundant source of, of, of CO2 in our atmosphere that can be combined with, with renewables to produce things like petrochemicals, plastics, carbon fiber, and fuels. And that has the ability to get us, again, about another 20 or 30% of the way to, the z to zero, with fuels being the biggest opportunity. And the last is that we actually need to think about putting carbon back underground again. And it's not a very popular topic, but the reality is, is that carbon sequestration is going to be a necessary evil until such time as A, we quit using fossil fuels, and, 
and B, you know, until we've actually got our climate to a stable point where, we're, where we can live with the carbon concentrations in the atmosphere. So if you think back to the last slide, one of the things that impl that's implied is that two of the three options require or need technology that's not yet deployed at scale, and that's carbon, atmospheric carbon dioxide removal. So the concept of atmospheric carbon dioxide removal isn't new. In fact, it's something that in the last couple of years has left the fringes of, of, uh, of early stage companies and crazy scientists. Is now a, a topic that's being discussed in, in academic and, uh, and policy circles as, as necessary. And if we look now at almost all climate models, including those put out by the IPCC and by National Academy of Science, negative emissions now are included in it to, to a very large extent in all models that get us or keep us to within the two degree targets of the 450 part per million targets. So despite that growing recognition, there really are only a handful of companies around the world and, and organizations around the world working on atmospheric CO2 removal. And carbon engineering is one of those that are leading in the space. So carbon engineering, we're a Canadian company. We're based just north of Vancouver. We have grown to about 25 employees. Uh, we were founded in 2009 by a fellow named David Keith, a Harvard, Harvard professor who's a well-known climate scientist. And, uh, and we've been funded by impact investors like Bill Gates and, and Murray Edwards, uh, alongside strong financial support from the Canadian government, uh, the province of BC, and, and now quite recently, the US Department of Energy to develop and demonstrate principally technology for the direct air capture of, of, of carbon dioxide that has the potential to scale up to megaton capacities. Uh, we have a very strong intellectual property portfolio, and we're one of the 11 finalists that were recognized uh, as candidates for the Virgin Earth Challenge. So really briefly on technology. So what carbon engineering has developed so far to date is a direct air capture technology platform that works at industrial scale. And for the most part, although we have a lot of innovations baked into our technology platform, the chemistry and the equipment that we use is, for the most part, uh, common, common and, uh, and without a lot of technical risks. So deployment risks are, are relatively low. Uh, some of the attributes of the direct air, uh, the, the carbon engineering direct air uh, capture platform are that a, it can be deployed anywhere, and at scale, it can capture CO2 for under $100 a ton. Uh, second is it's a chemistry-based approach that A, doesn't break laws of thermodynamics, it doesn't emit more CO2 than it captures, and it has the ability, because of its inherent uh, process-based architecture, to be able to be scaled to megaton per year or larger capture capacities. And important is that the CO2 that we capture can be delivered in a pure form, and that pure CO2 embodies a negative emission, which then can be transferred on to products that you would choose to make. And in particular, we're interested in the, in the synthesis of hydrocarbons like diesel and gasoline. So that's a pretty good segue of time to talk about the specifics of, of air-to-fuels technology. So by air-to-fuels technology, what I mean is the synthesis of liquid hydrocarbons like gasoline or diesel using atmospheric CO2 and hydrogen produced from re renewable sources as the feedstocks. So the synthesis piece of that is something that's not new. In fact, the synthesis of liquid hydrocarbons has technical precedence going back to the Second World War, but typically uh, synthesis is done either from other fossil feedstocks like coal or natural gas. And when you synthesize gasoline or diesel from those feedstocks, you inherently end up with another fossil fuel that, that has a, a carbon intensity greater than, the, than the, uh, the feedstocks that you produced it. If, on the other hand, you were to take that basic synthesis technology and feed it with atmospheric CO2 and hydrogen produced renewably, you actually can produce carbon neutral hydrocarbons. So the question is, is that, you know, why do we think that this is the time to think about deploying carbon neutral hydrocarbons or uh, air to fuels now? And really, there's a convergence of, of two advancements in the last few years which make air to fuels viable today. And the first is the fact that we've been able to demonstrate the commercial viability of large scale and cost effective air capture. So that means being able to capture atmospheric CO2 and deliver it in a pure, pure form 
for under $100 a ton. And the second is the rapid drop in the cost of renewable power, and in particular industrial solar. And so today there's industrial contracts for solar power being let out for under three cents a kilowatt hour. And certainly that's going to be, there'll be contracted solar for two cents a kilowatt hour within the next five years. And so that combination of atmospheric CO2 and very inexpensive renewables coupled with fuel synthesis technology, which has now been tailored for non-fossil inputs, allows us to synthesize hydrocarbons for under a dollar a litre. And again, what are some of the other attributes that we care about? So these fuels are compatible with all the existing infrastructure. And importantly, they have about a thousand times lower footprint without the competition for food crops when compared with biofuels. And the last thing is that carbon neutral hydrocarbon liquid or liquid hydrocarbon fuels are a really nice complement to things like EVs entering into those markets where electrification is very difficult. So things like aviation, long haul transport. So final question is really that I want to pose is, is there, is there really going to be a market for these carbon neutral hydrocarbon fuels? And I guess I would start by, by posing, or posing this question is, or we're putting it this way, is that if you first believe that we are serious about getting to net zero carbon, and secondly, if you also believe that we're not going to be willing to give up our ability to have global mobility, then certainly you have to believe that there's going to be a major transformation of the transportation fuel sector markets over the coming decades. And certainly, from our perspective, we believe that... Uh, that the air to fuels concept will play a large part in that. Thank you.